my brothers at? Where are my brothers at? Man, I'm excited. I'm excited to be back this year. I've been invited back. Anytime I'm invited to go anywhere to preach, I'm surprised. But when I'm invited back, I'm shocked. <laughs> and this is my ninth year. Actually, Cam and I started together over the links, right? The, the link, rather. And so this is my ninth year. I'm glad to be here, guys, and I'm glad you are here. And we are talking about this subject of strongholds. And I want to talk about that today in my time. Now, again, I say this, you know, in baseball analogy, you know, the leadoff hitter doesn't have to be very powerful, just fast, right? So I'm going to tell you what my plan is. I'm going to try to hit a little dribbler down the third baseline and leg it to first, all right? And wait for the big bats after me. I'm excited about what we're going to talk about today and what I'm going to hear and what I'm going to learn because we've got great preachers in the house tonight. I want to use one verse of scripture as a springboard, and then what I would like to do is just talk to you. I say all the time to the band of brothers, and I mean this with all my heart, what I, I really seek to do when I take the word of God in my hand is I really seek to preach to myself and just let you all listen. I believe that everything that's being said tonight is being said to me. And I pray God some will splash on you and that we will leave from this place better men because of what we've heard from the word of God. Here's that verse and you know it. It's a verse out of 1 John. It's chapter number two and verse number 15 where the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the Bible makes it clear that the world is passing away. So it tells us here, this one verse of scripture, it tells us not to love the world. You know, as believers, as men and as believers, we have three enemies to our growth and development as Christians. Of course, one is the flesh. You have an internal enemy. Now, I'm not talking about the skin that's on you. I'm talking about the sin that's in you. It is from our first birth. It is our natural birth, the carnal birth. We have a tendency and a bent and proclivity towards sin. Sin has gone viral in us, in our Adamic birth, right? In Adam, all die. We, the reason Jesus says you must be born again is because you were born wrong the first time. So that first birth and the flesh, my sinfulness, right? That, that is down in me. That is an enemy to the will of God and the plan of God for my life. It's an internal enemy. Then, of course, the devil. The Bible makes it clear that the devil is your adversary. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about, seeking whom he may not just distract, but devour. I mean, he wants to tear you up. He wants to tear up everything that you love because he hates everything that God loves and loves everything that God hates. And so your flesh is an enemy. The devil, of course, is an enemy. But the third enemy is what we might call the world. The Bible says here clearly that we are not to love the world. Now, it's not talking about the globe. It's not talking about even people in the world. The word world, it's a, it's a Greek word, cosmos, and we get our word cosmology and cosmetics. It has to do with the order of things. Love not this world's order, right? And so I don't know what we think about when we think about the word world, but most of the time we're thinking about what I might call brutal hostility. You know, the world attacks in different ways. One of the ways is brutal hostility. Do you know that there are people who love Jesus who are in hot spots today, who are suffering for the name of Christ? Now we can come to a meeting like this, we can advertise it on the radio and we can let people know that we are here and we can leave here roaring and all of that. But there are places in the world where your brothers and sisters are being persecuted because they love Jesus. It is an anti-Christ 
system that hates God and they are persecuted. Now, we don't so much sense that and we don't so much have that, but you know, that's the world. But you know what? The world's most, I think, effective approach is not brutal hostility, but rather is subtle hospitality. That is not going against us, but saying to us, come right on in and sit right on down. And we are so comfortable with the world and its system that we can hardly see that these things that maybe we call harmless are doing us great harm. Great harm. And so I want to talk about this, the stronghold of the world. Now, what do we think about when we think about strongholds? Most of the time, we're thinking about maybe hurts or habits or hang-ups. We're talking about addictions, maybe. People think about pornography, of course. You talk to men, you talk about pornography, or you talk about some addiction and alcohol uh, or to drugs, whether it's illegal drugs or whether it's controlled substances, whether it's we're talking about prescription drugs, maybe we're talking about gambling or lust or whatever. These strongholds, most of the time we think about these things, we think, and we're right to do so because these are strongholds in the life of men. That's why I love men conferences because, hey guys, we, we're not that, 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 uh, that, not that much difference between any of us. I don't care who you are, how much money you make, where you come from, not that much difference. That's why we can just come right in here, jump down on ground zero and get started. We don't have to play around, right? Because we're the, your battles and your issues are my battles and my issues. And so let's talk about it, all right? But when we talk about strongholds, most of the time we are talking about those kinds of things and we're right to do that. But when we talk about uh, uh, the world, I wonder sometimes what we think about. I think maybe we're thinking about smoke-filled honky-tonks or bars. We think about all of these, you know, all of these things that we are not to love the world. That's the world. But listen, I want you to consider this with me today. When we say love not the world, we could very easily substitute the word world for the word, for the word culture. Love not the culture. Now, let's just talk about it today because in this place, right here in this place, there are not just one or two cultures, there are many cultures in this place today. There's some general ones, there's some very specific. For instance, there's racial culture. We have different racial cultures in this place. Now can we just be honest? Hey, nobody here but us, so men, let's talk. Right? Can we be honest to say that generally speaking, we can find in the world that black people act one way and white people act another way? You don't have to say amen, it's true. <laughs> I brought my own amen with me. <laughs> now listen, I'm, I'm going right at this racial thing right, because we got to talk about it. When are we going to talk about it? Right, right, right now. So watch, black people act a, a certain way. We got a culture. White people have a culture. Right? So we have racial culture in this place, and no sense in denying it, right? And hey, it's okay. Sometimes I hear people say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm colorblind. You lying. <laughs> you not cut you ain't gonna tell me you don't know I'm a black man up here tonight. <laughs> I'm black and been black for 58 years. <laughs> and nobody taught me how to be black. And that's all right. And I know you're white. I'm not, I'm not colorblind any more than I'm gender blind. I know the difference between a man and a woman. <laughs> so it is what it is. There, there are racial cultures, there are geographical cultures. You know, people pretty much from one side of the Mason-Dixon line act different than people down here in the good old South, God's country, yeah. right? <laughs> People act, act differently up there where Bill Fowler was born, right? Then, hey, then, then you've got like, like Dr. Temple is from the West Coast, the left coast. Uh, 
I mean, come on, guys. So there is their culture. There's that Western culture. Hey, th these are all cultures here. Hey, can we just go and be honest? They're gender cultures. Men, I don't care whether we're black or white, Hispanic, I don't, Asian, where we come from. Men pretty much have a culture that women don't have. Women have a culture. They think our culture is weird. We know their culture is weird. <laughs> they, they do weird stuff. You ever go out on a double date or a triple date sometime and you sit there and all the women get up and go to the restroom together? <laughs> that will never happen with men. <laughs> it ain't happening. Hey, bro, I'm going to go to the restroom. Yeah, me too, dog. Yeah, that's what's up. <laughs> that ain't happening. We have these cultural differences. They're generational differences. People above a certain age kind of like act the same and people you know, who are younger act, I mean, that's just the way the world is and there's culture. But now here's my point is this, we love our culture. We love, and this, listen, I'm not talking about maybe bad, bad, bad things. I'm talking about maybe harmless things that have the potential to do us great harm because they keep us from hearing a clear word from God. I listen to things through the filter of my culture. Do you know that you don't really see the world as it is? You see the world as you are. And the way you are comes from the culture. Now the culture may not in itself be bad, it may be innocuous, it may be what I might call harmless, but we all come, if you know the name of Christ and you are all called out of the world, we come to Christ and we come, watch this, bringing our culture. It's like, it's like, uh, and it goes down deep into us. It's like if you've been around a, a, a campfire, a bonfire, or a barbecue, and you leave that place and you go somewhere, you smell like smoke. It's in every fiber. You don't, in fact, you cannot even know that you smell it so much, but everybody you come in contact with know you reek of it, right? You're reeking of it. If a, a smoker, you may not know you smell like smoke, but people you come in contact with know you're a smoker because it's in your hair, it's in the fiber of your clothes, and you don't so much think about it, but it's real. So now watch this, as Christian men, we come to Christ, but we come with the smell, the taste, the mindset of our culture. And I'm not saying that our culture may be a bad thing, but I'm telling you, many times our culture keeps us from hearing what God has to say to us. And we will end up, if we're not careful, with a cultural worldview rather than a Christian worldview. So, let's think about that. We have our American culture, right? And then out of that, we come all different slices of Americana, things that are good, I mean, wonderful in and of themselves. But you know what the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 23? I love this verse. You might mark this down. It's a great verse in the Word of God. It says, gentlemen, it says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Now, I'm going to tell you, that's a great verse because it lets us know that the truth costs you something. You understand what I'm saying? The truth is not cheap. The truth is, is costly. You have to buy it. Now, you can't, you, you can't buy truth with money. You can buy education with money. You can buy a, a diploma with money. You can buy information with money. You know, you got good Google search. You can buy a lot of things with money. You can't buy truth with money. Well, the, the question then becomes, what do you buy the truth with? Maybe I've said this to you before, but let me tell you what you have to buy the truth with. You have to buy the truth with your lie. You know what buying something is. You, you, it's an exchange of commodities. If you need gasoline, you go to the store. You've got 
$50 in your pocket? Well, your car does not run off of $50 bills. It runs off of gasoline. So you are willing to give something of value up in order to get something of more value to you. That's what we do when we go to the store, when we buy milk, when we buy gasoline, when we buy anything. You take something of value, you give it up to get something of value, of greater value to you at that time. Every time you bought something, that's what you've done. And so the Bible says, buy the truth. How do you buy the truth? You buy the truth with your lie. Now watch this. I know that we have all kinds of lies that have been pressed down into us from our culture. And you will not hear the voice of God. Now, you may be in church and hear his word every Sunday, but you will never hear his voice. So long as you hold to your cultural lie, you will not be able to hear the truth of God's voice. So the Bible says, buy the truth. That means you've got to be willing to take your valuable lie. It may be a racial lie. It may be a generational lie. It may be a gender lie. It may be whatever it is. And it comes right out of your culture. I know that in this room tonight, there are people who hold dear to their hearts, things that they have no business believing. But those things are dear to you. This is what my mom and them always said, my daddy and them, and all this. And, and listen, this is the, the problem with the church today. I understand we're sinners saved by the grace of God, but people come out of their cultures and not willing to unhand those things and let God do a thorough work in us so that he might be glorified. We come with somehow an idea that I have a right to hold on to my position. It's just not true. So the Bible says, by the truth, I've got to be willing to give up my life. For instance, in our American culture, and I know this is to be true, I listen to the talk today, especially around political seasons. There are people in here who think perhaps got a picture of God in heaven sitting on a throne wrapped in an American flag with a big King James Bible in one hand and the Bill of Rights in the other hand. <laughs> now, I already know I'm going to be misunderstood. I know there are going to be people here leave here and say, well, that brother's not for American freedom and justice and all of that. I am. But how many of y'all know God's not an American? You say, well, what is he then? He's God. How about that? <laughs> He's the God of the nations. He's the God of the universe. And you can't Americanize God. God's not wrapped in an American flag. Now, hey, I don't leave here. If you leave here saying, that brother don't love America, you are lying, the truth ain't in you. <laughs> I love America. I, I stand up for the flag. I believe everybody ought to. Yeah. Now you guys, you keep on clapping. I'll be around your way just a minute. <laughs> just, just hold that thought. I stand up for the flag. I'm a United States Marine. Ooh, raw. I love America. When the flag comes by, I put my hand on the heart. Sometimes I'll salute. And hey, you may think I'm a little hokey, but sometimes I get tears in my eyes. Because I love it. But let me just tell you this now. As Christians, watch this. That's not where the battle lines are drawn, folk. I hear it in Christian circles, man. We are drawing the lines in the wrong place. Like, that's got to be the Christian fight. It means being a Christian means being a good patriot. And we're making a lot of noise. And for instance, there are people who take a knee when the anthem 
uh, is played or when the flag comes by. I personally disagree with that. But let me just tell you this. You guys who make a big deal about that, you make a big deal and it's okay. But then you'll come to church and won't even sing. Now you, and I'm asking you, what's worst? We've been commanded by God to sing a song of praise to him. And you sit in church with your arms folded, teaching your little boy that singing is something women and little children do. That's worse than taking a knee during the national anthem. But see, your idea is the Christian thing, the right thing to do is to stand up. But I don't see that in the Bible. What I do see is a commandment for us to sing and to worship our God and to lead our families in that. Now, if you leave here saying, I'm not a patriot, you're wrong. I love it. But I'm just saying, let's draw the lines where we're supposed to draw the line. We need to buy the truth. And especially around political issues and there's all this noise and nonsense that's coming across the radio and CNN and Fox. And we think that the battle lines are fought and drawn in Washington, they are not, friend. It's not, and by the way, it is not the voters' booth, it's the prayer closet where the battle will be won. <laughs> we have to buy the truth. Now, now guys, I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm for the Second Amendment. I believe in the right to bear arms. In fact, I got me a it ain't none of your business what I got, but. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I want you to understand this. God is concerned about the second commandment more than he is the second amendment. Love your neighbor. Ask yourself. You're going to draw a line, Christian men, draw a line right there. That's what we're commanded to do. Love people. And so what I hear around this political season is people run into their little corners. They make a big deal about things that are important to them and we think that we are being Christian because everybody around us agree with us. And we don't even realize what God has said. I'll just say this, Brother Cam, I know this is, this is, you may say this is thin ice and maybe I don't get to come back next year, but I didn't ask to come this year. You do know that, right? <laughs> so, so let me just say this. Let me just say this. I see this. I see sometimes with black people. We, we, we look through at life through the prism of our culture rather than scripture. It's not just true about black people, it's true about all people. But I'm just saying, I know our people sometimes, we're so angry or mad about what has happened or what we feel like has happened, we can hardly hear what God is saying to us today. We can hardly hear it. Some of y'all are saying, well, see that brother getting out. Already, you shut me off. So these are strongholds, these things that like smoke in our clothes, they're granular, they go down into us and they hold us and God can hardly get a word into us edgewise. Do you have a Christian worldview or simply a cultural worldview? Can I just say this? That the most sharp and penetrating rebuke I find Jesus giving, Brother Bill, in the Bible was not to the Sadducees or, or the Pharisees, and he gave scathing remarks to them. It wasn't to Judas who betrayed him. You know who it was to? Peter, who loved him. Jesus said, well, the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be put on the cross and I'm going to die and I'll raise up the third day. And Peter, who, by the way, had just said, we believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, good for you, Simon Peter, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my father. And so Peter was pretty, pretty good about himself. He didn't get four verses down the page. Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. And Peter says, oh, no, you ain't either. 
Didn't, the Bible says took him aside and rebuked him. Didn't you just hear me say you the Messiah? And Jesus said this, get behind me, Satan. Now we know he was talking not just to Peter, but through Peter to the devil. Because watch this, it was the devil doing the thinking, though it was Peter doing the talking. So Jesus spoke to Peter and he spoke through Peter. But he said to Peter, and I know it must have shocked Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Why did he say that? Because thou savest the things. You hold in high regard the things that have to do with man rather than God. That comes right out of the culture. You know what? Peter couldn't imagine in his mind that the Messiah would die. Jewish people didn't think that way. So what? The scripture said that. They didn't think that. In John chapter number 12, they came to Jesus. What do you mean the Son of Man is going to be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? We've heard that the, the Messiah, the Christ, abides forever. Who is this Son of Man you're talking about going to be lifted up? If I be lifted up, I'll draw him in. Who is that? We've always believed that the Messiah abides forever. They couldn't see the cross, and God couldn't even convince them that it was going to happen. So Jesus had to rebuke him because of his cultural view of what the Messiah would do, what the Messiah would look like, what would happen, and Jesus rebuked him. And I wonder if the Lord might be saying to us, we are so gripped by things that are important, ideas and notions and concepts that come right from the world and not from God, and God can hardly get a word in to us because we have things that we believe and that we love and they are valuable to us and they are in and of themselves don't seem to be, uh, you know, bad. They're decent. They're good things. They're harmless, but they're doing us great harm, so much so that we can hardly fellowship and appreciate one another because we have our cultural differences that get in the way of genuine love and fellowship that will cause the world to see this is a genuine bunch of Jesus lovers. So I'll say this to you, I don't care whether you're black or whether you're just a South Georgia good old boy, what is it that you hold in so close that God can't speak into your life and the love of Christ be shown in your life? Well, my time is up, but I'm going to tell you a story about the greatest lesson I learned in high school. I want you to pick that picture up if you will. If you will. See that shoe there? I, this, the greatest lesson I learned in high school, I learned on graduation night of my high school. And um, it's 1978. And we had a party after graduation ceremony on Jekyll Island. I graduated from Glen Academy High School. We had a party over there. And down on one end of the condominiums was the black party. We were getting down. <laughs> and on this end was the white party. They were getting down. We had that music playing. We were playing the Ohio player roller coaster and fire. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> we had it turned all the way up. And they were down there playing Peter Frampton, do you feel like I do? <laughs> Anybody 1978, that crowd down here? They were cranking it up down there. And we had our parties. Well, after night got on, and I can tell you, we were feeling pretty good, for, for, you know. And uh, the parties begin to kind of merge. And before long, there's this guy from the white party came down to our black party. He's in there in the middle of the floor, and some of us, we were laying around there in the, in the place, probably 12 of us. And old Chuck was, I ain't gonna say his last name because he might be here. <laughs> but Chuck was in the middle of the floor, really just acting a fool. And we were laughing at Chuck and laughing with Chuck and all that. And um, he, all during high school, here's what we said. All me and my buddies, all my friends, we'd always say, why in the world do these white people all wear the same kind of shoes? <laughs> Put that shoe back up there. Put that shoe back up there. Watch out, that shoe. 
They all, like, they all wear blue jeans, a t-shirt, no socks, and no shoes. Dark side of the top side of the something like that. And we walk around in high school saying, why do they all wear the same kind of shoes? That was just known among my brother, my, you know, my homies. Like, what's up with this? They all wear the same shoes. Ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, they all wear the same kind of shoes. <laughs> Graduation night. Chuck's in the middle of the floor, acting a fool, in the middle of the party. Now, he said, hey, guys, hey, wait, wait, wait. Now, he's the only white guy in there. Black guys, 12 of us laying around there. He said, hey, I got to ask you black people something. <laughs> we were interested in what he had to say. <laughs> so, so he says, I got to ask y'all one question. We say, what do you want to ask us, Chuck? He says, why do you black guys all wear the same kind of shoes? <laughs> so help me, I look down around that place and to a man, we all had on the same kind of shoes. <laughs> I could not believe it. I mean, through the haze and the smoke and the, I was thinking, how could I have missed this? I mean, every, all of us. And we was like, no, 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 y'all, y'all all went. But, but there we were, we're all the same kind of. I say all that, say this, guys, listen. I had come from my little old slice of the world, and I could see things that were obviously wrong, or obviously this way or that way in the lives of other people, and never really considered myself. And all I'm saying is, folks, maybe, maybe we come to the party, maybe we come to pivot with our own little slice of culture, and we know what's wrong with people. We know what's wrong with the world, and we've never really considered ourselves. And maybe like Nathan said to David, maybe thou art the man. The Bible says, love not the culture. Father, Take these few scattered words and do an eternal work in the hearts of these men. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. <laughs>